In terms of the military, yeah, it's a drain. I mean, it's, it's, it's a waste, you know, we're, we're taking money that could be spent productively, you know, could be spent on building up our infrastructure, educating our people, providing health care, any number of things that are productive. Instead, we're spending it on, on useless or even harmful activities, you know, we're talking about wars. So, yeah, you know that about it, it's a drain on the economy. Thanks for joining us. My name is David Boris with Chicago Area Peace Action. With the coming to town, originally, of the G8 uh, and the NATO summit. Unfortunately now, of course, the G8 won't be coming to Chicago, which loses the tailor-made opportunity to connect economic policy with militarism. Uh, but with the coming of, of, of that, uh, CAPA, Chicago Area Peace Action, coupled up with a number of other national and international organizations to put together a counter-summit. Um, May the 18th, Friday, and Saturday, May the 19th. That counter summit uh, can be found on Network for a NATO Free World, and you can register for that. Uh, it's going to be limited to 300 attendees, and uh, it'll be a series of workshops and plenaries, and there will be an output statement uh, at the end of that process on Saturday. Um, but during the run up to that, uh, we realized as uh, an active organization in the host city that we had an obligation to do a little bit of public education around some of the economic issues, uh, macro and micro, I think. Uh, and in our work to do that, we invited Dr. Dean Baker uh, to come and join us to talk about this global economic crisis. Uh, if you listen to uh, the cacophony of conversation, uh, particularly uh, around uh, our primary election here in Illinois yesterday, you know, you hear a lot of different stories about how we uh, got here, uh, how we get out of it, how we get back to what once was, and I think it can be pretty confusing. I'm not promising that you'll leave here tonight uh, completely enlightened, but I am promising that you will get some narratives uh, and some information that will help you clarify your thinking. Um, title of our talk tonight, uh, Need or Greed, Who's Responsible for the Global Economic Crisis? Or I would rather call it, How the Hell Did We Get Here? Um, and uh, we've invited Dr. Baker. I just want to tell you a couple things about Dean. Uh, his PhD is from Michigan a former senior economist at the Economic Policy Institute, and now currently a co-founder and co-director of the Center for Economic, policy, Economic and Policy Research. He's the author of eight books. I won't read all the titles to you, but I'll read a couple of them. Um, Plunder and Blunder, The Rise and Fall of the Bubble Economy, uh, How the Conservative, um, excuse me, the conservative nanny state, how the wealthy use the government to stay rich and get richer, and his most recent book that I just finished reading, uh, The End of Loser Liberalism, Making Markets Progressive. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce Dean Baker. Well, thanks. That was a very nice introduction. Um, it's, it's really a great honor to be here. I, I grew up in Chicago, and I'm embarrassed to say I'd never been in this building before, but it's really a beautiful place, and I feel kind of intimidated uh, speaking here, so I will have to try to say something good. I hope I won't uh, disappoint, at least not too much. I, I, I'm not sure complete enlightenment is what I'll shoot for, but hopefully at least a little bit. Um, first off, let me just say, you know, I, I was sort of struck. I mean, I know I was invited out here. It was part, uh, part of the idea was the build up for, you know, the events around the G8 summit, and now you know, that's been moved to, to back to my neck of the woods, Camp David. And, you know, I, I imagine it's somewhat of a letdown, but I, I don't think people should see that as a letdown. I mean, I think to some extent that's a victory. Um, you know, it, what that means is that obviously they're moving there because they'd rather not have the issues be debated, have more of a public forum. And I'll just tell you to start quickly, you know, one similar story um, where we could consider it at least somewhat of a victory back in my grad school days. I, I did my graduate work at the University of Michigan. And I remember back in 1984, um, this was at a time when the United States, there was a lot of talk, thankfully this didn't happen, but there's a lot of talk the United States might invade Nicaragua. 
Um, you had uh, the Sandinistas had uh, overthrown the Somoza dictatorship. Uh, they'd been elected into office at that point. The Reagan administration was constantly compl complaining this and that about them. Um, so there's a lot of talk that we might uh, go ahead and invade Nicaragua. At that time, uh, we got wind of the fact that the CIA was going to do recruiting on campus. And Michigan, we figured, God, Michigan has this radical reputation. You can't let the CIA just come on campus and not have any sort of, you know, protest, any sort of event. Well, the CIA was scheduling a public meeting. They were going to have a, you know, CIA does, you know, whatever, careers with the CIA. I don't know exactly what was planned. We found out where there was going to be, and a whole group of us came there. We probably had about 200 people in the room, and we had a guy dressed as a judge. And he came into the room, and he said, okay, the case of the people of the world against the CIA will now come to trial. And then we read out things they had done. They overthrew the government in Iran in 53. They overthrew the government in Guatemala in 54. They were tied to the death squads in Guatemala more recently at that point, the 80s in El Salvador. And, and, you know, the guys, from the, the people from the CIA, you know, they're kind of like, oh, my God, what's going on here? And then one of them said, well, we didn't come here to talk about those things. And then the people said, well, we did. <laughs> At which point they scurried out of the room. And <laughs> but, you know, it was funny. What was amazing was, you know, they, they then announced they were scheduled to be there for two days of recruiting. They announced that they, they were, you know, were all very happy. They left, whatever. They, they announced that they were going to cancel the second day of recruiting, they said, because they feared for their physical safety. And, you know, all going, you know, I was asking my friends, did you threaten them? You know, but, you know, I mean, the point was they didn't want to confront a protest. No one was threatening them. I mean, they knew, you know, that there was, their physical safety was not in jeopardy. It was just they did not want to be confronted. They did not want to have these issues raised. And that's, I think, what went on here with the G8. And, you know, it's unfortunate that, you know, we, we have, you know, that, that our, our leadership feels that they don't want to have these issues raised and discussed. But, you know, I think you should consider that a victory. I will say a little bit about, you know, just very quickly an episode on sort of the other side, as close as I've ever gotten to being on the inside, which wasn't too close. But shortly after uh, President Obama got into office, they had a G20 meeting. And I was on a list. They invited uh, several uh, number of people from different think tanks around town to come down to the Treasury Department to get a, a briefing about the U.S. position at you know the G upcoming G20 meeting. So I figured, well, you know, why not? I got a couple hours. Sure, it might be interesting. So anyway, I go there thinking, okay, what are what do they think are going to be the big issues? This and that. Well, fairly quickly, someone said, you know, keep in mind they just created the G20 before you had the G8, which I mean we still have, but you know it's all wealthy countries. So G20, you know, you have Indonesia, some relatively poor countries, at least in the scheme of things. So fairly quickly, one of them said, well, you know, we're rotating these summits. Can Indonesia, and I might be wrongly maligning Indonesia, can Indonesia? Do they really have the ability to host one of these? And then they started talking about their hotel capacity, their internet connections, how hard it is to get a cab in Indonesia. Um, anyhow, so some of this could be uh, pretty banal. Uh, so it's not all evil, I'll just put it that way. Um, so anyhow, that, yeah, I, I didn't get much out of that meeting other than finding out that a lot of these people, very important people, waste their time on what looked to me like nonsense. But. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, what I wanted to do tonight was talk a bit about how we got here, you know, what the economic crisis was, and, or is, I should say. And there really shouldn't be a lot of mystery on it, but I think a lot of what has been going on is a real effort to obfuscate what happened, how we got here, and what are the keys to getting out. Because, again, I don't think how we got here really should be that big a mystery, and getting out of here shouldn't be all that hard, but unfortunately, um, the politics are such that it's likely to be very hard, and it's likely to take a very, very long time to get out. And I should just point out, I mean, in the context of the current election, I find myself, the upcoming election, I should say, the November election, I find myself in sort of an odd situation, because, you know, on one hand, you have all the Republicans who want to beat up on President Obama for saying, oh, the economy's really bad. I'm not particularly anxious to beat up on President Obama, but the reality is the economy should be much better. Now, the Republicans don't have a way to make it much better. But, you know, the point is uh, no one should be happy, no one should be satisfied with the situation we're in, 8.3% unemployment, and perhaps even more importantly, there's no real prospect we'll get to what we would consider full employment or normal rates of unemployment anytime soon. Okay, well, just to back up, um, you know, how did we get here? I, I was uh, watching someone emailed it to me. I'll get email with them. They emailed me a video of uh, Paul Ryan, Representative Ryan, the chair of the Budget Committee. You all know who Representative Ryan is now. He's kind of a celebrity in these days. Certainly in Washington, I imagine you all hear about him out here. He did a little video. He's walking through the halls of Congress, and he's going, imagine that we were facing an enormous economic crisis, and we didn't do anything. That's immoral, you know, and this and that. 
But, you know, what was amazing was he excuses himself. He goes, well, we didn't see that last one coming. <laughs> well, who's we? Um, you know, and, and that, that really, it really is remarkable, because he's not alone, of course. He could say that in Washington, everyone goes, yeah, yeah, we didn't see it coming. Um, well, we did. Um, we who, you know, follow the economy closely and could think about it with clear eyes, uh, um, it, it wasn't a surprise. I mean, the basic story, and, and I'll backtrack a little bit, the, the basic story is that the U.S. economy has been driven by bubbles for much of the last two decades. Uh, this started in the Clinton years, and it would be bipartisan here. It started in the Clinton years. So what you had in, in uh, the Clinton era was, you know, we had very good growth in the late 90s. So the Clinton people like to say, oh, we we're so great, we got the budget deficit down, balance the budget. Well, no, that's not really true. Um, what happened was we had a stock bubble. And, you know, the stock market hit unprecedented levels, or I shouldn't say unprecedented, we can go back to the 20s, I guess, or about the, you know, if you look at price earnings ratios, they're comparable at the peak of the 20s bubble. But in any case, the stock market hit levels that we had not seen for 70 years, and it was driven by a bubble. They didn't make sense. You know, Greenspan made his famous comment about rational exuberance. You know, people were buying up nonsense. You had dot whatever. People were, you had kids in their 20s who were selling companies that they didn't even know how it could make a profit, and they were putting hundreds of millions of dollars in their pocket. And that was what was driving the economy. Um, it did two ways. Uh, one way, uh, just th this was one of these rare occasions, economists, or I shouldn't say economists, but sort of the folklore is that companies sell stock to invest. That's actually very, very rare. It's very rare that a company is actually selling shares of stock to invest. Usually when a company is issuing stock, it's basically to get out, you know, so that you have people that have already made money in the company and they want to get out to sell their stake. That's usually the story. So it's not that they're directly selling stock to invest. But actually in the late 90s, 98, 99, 2000, that was going on. That really was going on. So we had an investment boom. A lot of it was junk investment, you know, it was Pets.com, all these other companies. It was junk investment. But it did create demand in the economy. So that was part of the story. The other part is, is simply that people had all this money in the stock market. You know, they, they saw their portfolios double, triple. They spent based on that. That's not new. I mean, this is, you know, when I was in grad school, it was like one of the first things we learned, wealth effect. You know, that if you have more wealth and stock being one form of wealth, uh, you spend more money. So if you look what was going on in the late 90s, people were spending lots of money. The savings rate plummeted, flip side. You know, you either spend your money or save it. Savings rate plummeted, fell to what that time were record lows. And that was what was driving the economy. And, you know, a lot of good things you could say about that. I mean, we got the unemployment rate down to 4% in, in, in 2000. I remember uh, arguing with economists back in 93, 94, because they all said the unemployment rate can't get below 6% without triggering inflation. I'm serious about this. I mean, you're basically an idiot if you thought the unemployment rate could get below 6% without inflation. Um, but, you know, there are a few of us who thought that might be the case. And fortunately, this is the one good thing I'll say about it, Alan Greenspan was in that crew. And he saw the unemployment rate fall below 6%, and he had a lot of people on the Fed say, hey, you got to raise interest rates. You have to slow the economy. And Greenspan said, no, you know, I don't really see any inflation. Why not let it keep going? Well, the good side of that was we got 4% unemployment. A lot of people got employment who would not have otherwise. Um, hugely benefited the most disadvantaged in society. You saw wage growth up and down the income ladder. The unemployment rate for African Americans fell below 6%. Hadn't been that low since the 60s. Um, even African-American teens were able to find jobs. The unemployment rate was still about 20 percent, but it's, you know, like 45 percent today. Um, so a lot of good things were happening then. But the bad part was that it wasn't sustainable. It was being driven by bubble, bubbles burst. Okay, so the, the whole logic of, you know, a, a bubble is that it could keep going as long as everyone thinks it will keep going. As soon as people start saying, wait, this company isn't going to make a profit, well, you know, that's when it falls apart. And that's exactly what happened. So that bubble collapses beginning in 2000. The NASDAQ hit a peak at that point of 5,000 in March of 2000. Um, it began to fall. I remember in the summer it was at 3,000. I had a friend who I think had a lot of money in the NASDAQ, or for him a lot of money. And he, he asked me, I remember he was saying, uh, you know, that can't go any lower. And I go, sure it can. And, and, and he said, well, how low can it go? I go, I don't know, 1,600. You know, then the next summer it hit 1,600. I, I wasn't sure whether I should call him and say, well, that's not a buy recommendation. Uh, <laughs> it actually fell. It bottomed out at like 1150. Um, so, so people who had a lot of money there, again, I don't think it was particularly wealthy, but you know, whatever money he had, I think he had a lot there. But in any case, the point was the bubble burst. People lost their money in the stock market, and we got the recession in 2001. The conventional wisdom, if you talk to economists, they all say, oh, it's a very short and mild recession. Well, I look at the data a little differently. 
Because if you say, well, officially, you know, the dating of the recession is March of 2001 to December of 2001. That's just about as short as the recession could be, seven months. The criteria is usually six, so that's a bare minimum. So it's just about as short as the recession could be. But we didn't actually start creating jobs. We didn't create jobs in 2001. We didn't create jobs all through 2002. We didn't actually start creating jobs until September of 2003. Okay, so to me, that looks like a pretty bad recession. We didn't make up the jobs we lost until January 2005. That was the longest period where the country had had you know, zero job growth, where we hadn't passed the prior peak since the Great Depression. So that didn't look like a mild recession to me. But the other part of the story was, how did we get out of that? How did we finally start to get job growth in, in 2003, 2004? Well, the housing bubble. Okay, so we went from one bubble, we went from the stock bubble, to the housing bubble, and the, the story I always like to tell, you've probably heard this one, you know, that an alcoholic, the, the way an alcoholic recovers from one hangover is they start on the next. Um, it's not a great strategy, you know. Uh, I've not been in that situation, but people have told me that, you know. Um, so, okay, so you, we start with another bubble. So how does the housing bubble drive the economy? Well, the housing bubble, bubble drives the economy both directly. We had a huge building boom, so housing, residential construction is usually about 3% of GDP. It soared to over 6% of GDP at the peak back in uh, 2005, 2006. So we had a huge amount of demand created by residential construction. The other way it drove the economy was through consumption. Again, this wealth effects story. I, you know, I've raised this with economists, they're looking like, where do you get it? I go, didn't we go to the same classes? You know, I mean, wealth effect. You, your house, you know, you have your house, you pay 200000 for it, it's now worth four hundred. That's true a lot of places. Chicago had a bubble, not the worst, but you know, certainly Chicago is one of the places where house prices rose a lot and have since plummeted. Um, but, you know, there are other areas, uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, where they probably tripled, you know, Phoenix, Arizona, lots of places in the country where people who suddenly, you know, they had middle class homes that got to 150000 200000 worth two or three times that. Well, people spent based on that, and that, that's pretty much what you expect to happen. It's a perfectly reasonable thing, as long as the price is going to stay there. And everyone was telling you the price was going to stay there. You know, you had Alan Greenspan out there saying, oh, everything's fine. You know, so we had a huge round of consumption spending associated with that bubble. So on the one hand, we had a huge burst of spending associated with, you know, construction of this building boom. On top of that, you had a huge consumption boom. The, the savings rate literally fell to zero at the peak of the bubble, 405, 06, 07. Savings rate literally fell to zero. On net, we weren't even saving. We are spending as much as, you know, so nothing, people weren't putting aside anything for retirement. It's usually about 8%, by the way, if you want a basic comparison. So if you look back to the pre-bubble era, usually people on average, doesn't mean everyone, obviously, but people on average save about 8% of their income. That fell to zero, 04 to 07. Okay, it's because of the housing wealth. Another part of that story, you know, an amazing, you go, these people are supposed to be very smart in business, but they seem to never learn. There was a bubble in non-residential real estate that followed almost directly on the bubble in residential. So as the bubble in residential starting to come down, that peaks in 06, so it's starting to come down, uh, construction and residential is falling off, non-residential goes whoosh. So it, it, you get the same story in non-residential, a huge building boom in uh, malls, office space, hotels, most forms of non-residential real estate. So that's picking up the gap. Okay, well, that was what was driving the economy until you got to the recession in, in 2007. And at that point, just the stock bubble, the collapse of that, pushed the economy into a recession. Same thing with, with, with the, this bubble in, in housing and non-residential real estate. So we see construction falls off. Construction had gone from 6% of GDP, that would be about $900 billion a year. This is annual numbers, $900 billion. It went to about 2% of GDP, $300 billion. So we had a loss in demand of around $600 billion associated with the collapse of construction and residential real estate. 600 billion a year, annual demand. Um, consumption, um, people stop spending because guess what? That wealth, you know, they're borrowing against the wealth in their home. You can't do that once that wealth's disappeared. So the savings rate goes up. It's still only around 5%. It still hasn't gone up to, you know, what I would consider a more normal level. But that's a loss of somewhere in the order of 700 billion a year in annual consumption. Somewhere around 5 percentage points of GDP. So they lost 600 billion because of the fall off in residential construction, 500 billion because of the loss, or I'm sorry, 700 billion because of the loss in consumption. Non-residential constr construction also falls off, the bubble there bursts, lose around 100 billion there. State and local governments, everyone's like Illinois. Uh, you're getting less money in tax revenue, state and local governments have, have to balance their budget. They cut back somewhere around 150 billion a year. In total, what we're talking about is a loss in annual demand of somewhere in the order of $1.4 trillion. 
Okay, well, is it surprised we have a downturn? You lose $1.4 trillion. Um, that gives you a very, very serious downturn. Um, President Obama comes in, he goes, well, let's have a stimulus package. And what does he propose? Well, the official number that, you know, he's always credited with, blamed with, however you want to put it, $800 billion. Okay, but let's look at this a little more closely, $800 billion. $100 billion of that was the alternative minimum tax. I won't go into detail with that. Those of you who are tax nerds know this doesn't, this is done every year. Um, if you're not a tax nerd, you'll have to trust me. This had nothing to do with stimulus. In other words, every year for like 20 years, Congress adjusts the alternative minimum tax. No one expects to pay it. It can't stimulate the economy because no one ever expected to pay it. So you pull that out, you got 700 billion. Okay, some of that money is spent in 2011, 12, 13. Okay, my reason for pulling this out is I want to focus on 2009, 2010, the immediate aftermath of the collapse of the bubble. We had about 600 billion in stimulus that was spent over those two years, 300 billion a year. We lost $1.4 trillion in demand. We're trying to replace that with 300 billion of stimulus. Well, guess what? That's not enough. Okay, and what's amazing to me is that, you know, people are saying, oh, well, you know, no one said at the time, you're going, what do you mean? No one said, there were a lot of us saying at the time, the most visible, of course, those of you who read Paul Krugman's Times column or his blog, he was up there saying that all the time. You know, I could point to any number of things, you know, I and others were saying. It wasn't a secret. You know, the arithmetic was very simple. Um, the stimulus was not going to be large enough. So, you know, to my mind, you know, people talk about the stimulus, you go, look, that was great. We created somewhere around two to three million jobs. There have been any number of studies that are associated with that, you know, by independent people, Congressional Budget Office, independent economists, I don't know whether they're Republicans or Democrats. They come up with comparable numbers. It's a range, no one can put an exact number on there. Somewhere around two to three million jobs. That's great. I mean, you know, two to three million jobs, that's a lot of people working wouldn't, wouldn't have been otherwise. But we needed somewhere in the order of 10 to 12 million jobs. Okay, so basically the story is we got a boost from the stimulus, we replaced much of what we lost, but it wasn't nearly enough. There's nothing to fill that gap. And what's worse was because it was only two years, it was basically 2009, 2010, well, a lot of that impact has, has faded away. So when we got to 2011, well, those of you who follow this stuff closely, the economy was very weak last year, it almost stopped growing in the first half of last year. The growth rate for the first half of 2011 was less than 1%. It wasn't a surprise. The stimulus had ended at that point. So we, we took a very, very big hit to the economy with that. Now, more recently, the economy's been growing at a somewhat better pace. The, the numbers for the fourth quarter of last year was about 3%. We have people in Washington at least celebrating that. They're going, wow, you know, that's great, 3%. You know, we're creating uh, the last three months, the average is about 240,000 jobs. You know, I look at that and I go, well, that's good. I mean, that's, you know, it's much better than we have been doing. Obviously, you have to be happy for 3% growth as opposed to less than 1%. So that's good news. Um, and 240,000 jobs is much better than what we're doing, you know, the first half of 2011. But important point to keep in mind, um, the economy, if we just look at its trend rate of growth, you know, what's the trend rate of growth? It's about 2.5%. Um, my reason for saying that is we have a big amount to make up. We have, we have a shortfall, you know, our gap in GDP is somewhere in the order of 6%. I, I'm not making up these numbers in the Congressional Budget Office, any number of people give you the same sorts of numbers. So to say, where should we be? It'd be about 6% higher. Again, ballpark number, people put it somewhere around 6% higher. Well, if we're growing at 3% a year and the trend rate of growth is 2 and a half, we're making up half a percentage point a year. That's 12 years, 2024. How does that sound? Um, that's not really good or take the flip side of that, we need about 100,000 jobs a month just to keep pace with the growth of the labor force. Okay, well, lately we've been creating 240. I don't think we'll keep that. In fact, very few people, even the Obama administration, no one's really predicting that we'll maintain that rate of growth. Let's say we continue to grow 200,000 jobs a month, which, you know, I think is doable. It's plausible. We might do better, we might do worse, but, you know, I think that would probably be, if you talk to most economists, their best guess is to you know, what we'll end up doing going forward. Well, if we create 200,000 jobs a month and we need 100,000 just to keep pace with the growth of the labor force, that means we're making up the shortfall at the rate of about 100,000 a month. Well, we have a backlog. We need about 10 million jobs to get back on trend. Okay, so 10 million jobs, we're filling it at 100,000 a month. It's 100 months, eight and a half years. Okay, 2020. Okay, doesn't look really good. 
Okay, so this is what I'm saying. You know, we, we should be, you know, happy the economy is growing. Obviously, it's better. We're creating jobs. We're having decent growth. It's not something to be thrilled about. And if we look back at past severe downturns, go to 81, 82, when the unemployment rate peaked to 10.8%, that was the worst downturn we had until the most recent one, or 74, 75, again, a, a very severe downturn, the economy is going 6 or 7%. You know, in, in the quarters immediately coming out of those downturns. Okay, so we were doing much, much better from downturns which actually weren't as severe as the one we just had. On top of that, if you look at job growth and you do a proportional labor force, you know, because they're obviously a much smaller labor force back then, we we're creating around 450,000, 500,000 jobs a month in the months of rapid growth coming out of that downturn. So by comparison, we're doing very poorly. And if you go, okay, well, how long did it take us after those downturns to sort of get back on trend, get back to where we'd been? It was about two or three years. Here we're looking at a situation where we might be talking about more than a decade. Okay, so we have a lot to be unhappy about. Um, it's not a good story. It's, you know, again, it, it's better than it could have been. And, you know, one of the jokes we have is, you know, you all remember President Obama when he ran the first time, hope and change. Um, and, you know, apparently the slogan this time was, it could have been worse. Um, so that's, you know, that, that's kind of how I outlined this, the situation. Um, now, now let me just say a couple things about how, how it could be better. Um, you know, how could you get the economy growing more rapidly? Well, part of the story is, you know, the simple one I was saying before, stimulus. I mean, you could have more. And, you know, this shouldn't be kind of wild, wild-eyed stories. I mean, a lot of the story is stimulus. Uh, a lot of the, the, the money went to state and local governments so they didn't have to make cutbacks, or at least as big cutbacks as they otherwise would have had to have made in 2009, 2010. Um, two nice things about that. One is that a lot of states, and I know Illinois was one of them, you had to cut back important services. You know, these are services that people always need, but particularly in the downturn, cutting back health care, cutting back education, school hours, extracurricular activities. All these things were cut back, state and local governments across the country, because of the downturn exactly at the time they're most needed. Okay, so if you'd gotten the money from the federal government, I know the states can't borrow infinitely, you all have balanced budget restrictions. If you had the money from the federal government, you don't have to make those cutbacks. Some of the money for the stimulus went for that purpose. It would have been great had there been more. The other thing that's really nice about that is that if you, if, you know, we want to have money spent quickly, well, there's no quicker way to have it spent than if there's a cutback that you could prevent. So if we know Chicago's going to lay off teachers or firefighters or whoever it is that they're making their cutbacks, we give them a check from the federal government. They don't do that. That's money that's immediately boosting the economy. So it's a really, really good way to, to, to boost the economy quickly in a way that has real benefits. The other part of the stimulus story is that we have a lot of longer-term needs. And th this one's kind of painful because, you go, look, we could have been spending money on infrastructure. Now, we did spend some, but most of it, there, there's this emphasis on shovel-ready. So you have to show... You had to show the White House, you know, you're ready to go. You had the plans on the books. That was fine. I mean, there were a lot of repair projects, you know, a lot of roads across the country. We had them in D.C. I'm sure you had them in Chicago. Roads and things, you know, were repaired. They were on the books. You could do them fairly quickly because you're going to do them anyhow. You know, you just did it in 2009, 2010, rather than waiting until 2011, 2012. But we could have talked about bigger infrastructure projects. We could have talked about, you know, High-speed rails, you know, one of my pet ones, I think that would be a great thing. They've had it in Europe for 40 years. We don't have it anywhere here. You know, so we should be able to do that. Um, but, you know, planning our infrastructure for the next, you know, four, five, six decades. You know, that's what we did in the New Deal. You know, we're still, you know, you don't, I'm sure I, I should know Chicago better than I do since I've been out of town much of the last four decades. But I'm sure it wouldn't be hard to walk out of, the, out of the door here and find any number of things that were built during the New Deal. Well, the Outer Drive, actually, I know that. I know that. That was built during the New Deal. So you don't have to go far to find infrastructure projects that were, were built in the New Deal that we're still benefiting from today, almost 80 years later. Well, back in 2009, the focus was on shovel-ready because somehow they had the idea that, well, if we didn't spend it in a year or two, it would be too late. Well, obviously that was wrong. Um, and for better or worse, it's probably still wrong today. So in other words, if we sat down and said, okay, what are the things we really should be spending you know, in terms of we really need for infrastructure, um, we still have plenty of time to do that. I should point out, too, we shouldn't think of this as just physical infrastructure. I mean, obviously, we, you know, we have, you know, infrastructure needs in terms of, like, you know, access to the Internet, um, research and development. 
These are all areas where we could invest today and have long-term dividends that extending into decades into the future, just as was the case you know, with the New Deal. And certainly it's been true with other forms of, of government investment. So that's one way in which we could and should look to boost the economy. And it, it really is unfortunate. And here I just you know, give a huge amount of blame to President Obama. You know, I'm well aware he had an obstinate Republican Congress that he had to you know, fight against every step of the way. But he really abandoned the effort to get stimulus right from the onset. Uh, some of you may recall, you know, he got a stimulus package through his big victory. You know, certainly he should have taken a bow and said, yeah, you know, we, you know, we did an important thing for the economy. But then he said, now we're going to focus on deficit reduction. And he started talking about the green shoots of recovery. I mean, this is just nonsense. And he should have known that. He should have known his stimulus package wasn't large enough. There were not green shoots of the recovery to talk about. And what that did was it made it almost impossible for him to go back and then say, hey, guess what, that wasn't large enough. Um, if you go back and look what President Roosevelt did, he lectured the country. You know, I keep being told by people, oh, people don't understand that. Well, Roosevelt thought they did, and I think he had an impact. He lectured the country. It wasn't you know, a question of you know, government's great, private sector's bad. The point was that if the government didn't create the demand, if it didn't employ people, the private sector wasn't going to do it. So it doesn't matter how much you like the private sector, job creators are all wonderful people and everything, but they weren't going to do it. There's no one who invests just because you pat them on the back and you say you like them. Don't even invest if you give them a big tax break. Okay? They invest when they see demand. And that's what businesses will tell you. you know, any number of businesses. You know, there's a survey that um, the National Federation of Independent Business does every month. They've been doing it for probably three decades now. And they ask small businesses. These are the heroes of you know, the Republican story. They ask small business owners, what is your biggest impediment to growth? Why aren't you expanding now? I worded something like that. And the overwhelming majority of these people say there's not enough demand. Very few complain about taxes. Very few complain about government regulation. They don't even complain about access to capital. They say there's not enough demand. That's something like 40, 45 percent say there's not enough demand. Businesses invest when they see the demand. And the private sector is not going to create that spontaneously. The government has to do it. Okay? And unfortunately, again, I think President Obama really you know, had very poor judgment. After a stimulus package passed, it wasn't big enough. His advisors all say, at least in retrospect, who knows what they're actually talking, saying at the time, but they all say that they knew it wasn't big enough, but yet he went out there and said, you know, okay, green shoots of recovery, now we're going to focus on deficit reduction. Okay, what else could we do? Um, I, I could go on about the Fed, but I always get scared when I talk about the Fed. I'll just say the Fed could be more aggressive. Um, I'm usually not a big champion of the Fed, but I will give Bernanke, you know, for going on a five-star system, he probably gets about two or three stars here, um, that he has been more aggressive than, say, the European Central Bank um, in, you know, in trying to boost the economy, you know, pushing the interest rate to zero. That was the right thing to do. Um, the quantitative easing programs, those were good. They, they aren't nearly enough, but they were steps in the right direction. And again, if we think the alternative is having something like the European Central Bank, which never lowered its short-term rate to 1%, they actually raised interest rates last year. What on earth they were thinking, I don't know. But, you know, by comparison, the Federal Reserve Board has been good. It could be more aggressive. I won't go into detail on that. If people have questions on that, I can talk about that. It could be more aggressive in trying to boost the economy. I wish it would be. Um, Bernanke also faces a lot of obstacles. I think there's a lot of politics on the Fed. That's something, by the way, I should say people should be more aware of. I think it's, you know, the Fed has this position, certainly it's treated this way in Washington, is sort of they're above everything. You know, uh, we have, you know, back in the old days when they had Alan Greenspan there forever, you know, he would lecture us from on high and tell us, you know, what was good and bad about the economy. There's still that same aura about uh, Bernanke as Fed chair that, you know, they, they come and give us the word from on high, as opposed to, no, the, the Federal Reserve Board is a creature of Congress. It's created by Congress. They're answerable to Congress. Um, and, and they should have to justify their policy. And it's totally appropriate for politicians to say, I don't like what the Fed's doing. I would like to see the Fed be more aggressive. Or, you know, you have other politicians who say they're being too aggressive. They should, I mean, it's, that's a political topic. That's a political debate we should be having. You know, and again, my position is, you know, they certainly could be more aggressive in trying to boost the economy. He's, he's been better than others, but not great. The one other point I'll say about Bernanke before you think I'm going to exalt Bernanke to the sky, I, I see him as complicit with Alan Greenspan getting us here. Um, Bernanke was Fed chair only from January of 06, at which point 
the cards were, had already been dealt, you know, with the bubble was pretty much at its peak. There wasn't too much you could do to escape sort of the bad fallout from it. But Bernanke was sitting there alongside Alan Greenspan as a governor of the Fed from 2002. So there's only seven governors, including the chair. So he was certainly in a position where he could have influenced policy. And if he was in any way unhappy with what was going on, he had a very powerful uh, uh, place from which to speak. And he never gave any, any indication that he was unhappy with what was going on at that point. So I'm not going to you know, praise Bernanke as being a great leader here. He deserves a lot of the blame for, for allowing the bubble to grow to the extent it did. But having done that, as I say, since the collapse of the bubble, I would say he's mostly done the right things in trying to boost the economy. I'm not going to say he's done the right things in bailing out the banks. That's another story. Um, we can come back to that one. Um, okay, the last thing that we could do, and we ultimately will have to do to boost the economy, is to get the dollar down. Um, and, and the story here, and it's, it's just amazing how few people in Washington ever talk about this or talk about it in these terms. It's a fairly simple story. We have a very huge trade, very large trade deficit. It's currently about 600 billion a year, about 4% of the economy. Um, it had been higher. It had been before the downturn. It had been about 6% of GDP. That would be about 900 billion in today's economy. One of the main reasons that it declined, or trade deficit is smaller today than it was at, at, at its peak back in 2006, is because of the recession itself. You get a downturn and you're buying less of everything, including less imports. So if we just snapped our fingers and you know, the economy grew so we were back at our capacity, well, our trade deficit would probably be, again, close to 6% of GDP. It would probably be somewhere around $900 billion. So the point is we have a lot of money leaving the country to buy goods and services that's not being offset by any imports. Okay, well, that's a real drain on demand. So we have all this money going out. It's buying goods in Europe and China, Japan, Latin America, wherever it might be. It's not creating demand in the United States. That creates a really big gap. How do you fill the gap? Well, one way we're partly filling it now is with the budget deficit. You could do that. So the government spends more than it takes in. That helps to fill that gap. The other way you could do that, and we did this in the last decade, is through the private sector spending more than it's saving. And that's what it did during the housing bubble years. We had the savings rate go to zero. So households weren't saving. We had a lot of construction, you know, bubble-driven construction. Well, we could do that, but that's not, terribly, that's not terribly healthy. That's not a path for healthy growth. So how do you get back to healthy growth? Well, you have to get the trade deficit down. You have to get it somewhere. It doesn't have to be balanced. Uh, people sometimes, I think, worship zero. We talk about balancing the budget, zero inflation. No magic to zero but it has to be lower than what it is. And how do you get the trade deficit down? Well, it's actually a simple story. You get the dollar down. It's a very, very simple story. That might sound stupid, but it's, it's about as simple as it gets. If the dollar falls, let's say we were to, you know, we could snap our fingers and the dollar tomorrow fell by 10% against all the currencies in the world, against the euro, against the yen, against the Chinese yuan, fell by 10% against all the various currencies in the world. Okay, well, the immediate impact of that is that all the goods that we buy from those countries now cost us 10% more. Okay, so we're getting clothes from China, we're getting cars from Germany, you know, all the things we're getting from elsewhere in the world, they suddenly cost 10% more. Well, what happens when goods cost 10% more? You don't need a PhD in economics, you probably buy less of them, right? Pretty straightforward. We buy more domestically produced goods, fewer imports. Okay, the other part of that story is the flip side. Okay, what happens to the price of our exports? You know, people are living in Europe, living in China, living in Japan, suddenly their currency, each you know their currency buys 10% more dollars. Okay, well, they'll probably buy more U.S. goods. Okay, so what the story we expect to see from that is that we're going to import less from other countries, we'll export more, that's getting our trade deficit down. Okay, well, as I say, the real key in that story is the value of the dollar falling. And the effects of that can be very, very dramatic. I just did some back-of-the-envelope calculations. I said, you probably need a fall in the dollar against all currencies, and we aren't going to see equal falls against every currency, some more than others. But if you had a fall in the value of the dollar, somewhere around 10%, 10 or 15% against other currencies, you'd see somewhere near 5 million new manufacturing jobs created. We'd see the manufacturing employment increase by about 40% from where it is today. Uh, that would have a very big impact on our economy, a very big impact on our labor market. Imagine that country suddenly created somewhere in the order of 4 million manufacturing jobs. That would have a very, very big impact on the economy. So, to my mind, that's a very big part of the picture. You have very few people in Washington talk about that. 
And I think the reason is, is straightforward, and you know, I, I be very concrete because I've actually had discussions with people in Treasury on this issue. Currency most often comes up vis-a-vis -vis China, and I, I always make a point saying it's not just China. China's obviously the big actor. You know, they're the, after us the largest economy, maybe larger than us now. But in any case, they're clearly the big actor. But it's not just the China story. It's a more general story. The dollar is overvalued against other currencies. Well, when the U.S. negotiates with China, and I heard someone in Treasury say this, they say, oh, yeah, we always raise the value of the currency as an issue because China does peg its currency. It's not, you know, we, we talk about them manipulating the currency. I think it's kind of silly because they openly peg it. So it's not like they're doing it in the dark. They do it very publicly. They have a pegged currency, um, and, and they keep the, their currency lower than it would be if it were left to the market, if they didn't peg it. Um, so they say, we always raise this issue with China, but we have lots of issues we raise with China. Well, think about that for a second. You know, your Geithner or whoever might be negotiating with China, you don't go to them with a laundry list and say, hey, here's 20 things we want you to do. I mean, you could do that maybe if you're in the United States, you're negotiating with Honduras, but you can't do that with China. Um, with China, you know, obviously it's a great power in its own right, and there's give and take. And if we decide that the most important thing we want is for them to raise the value of their currency against the dollar, well, it's got to be not, I'm number one on the list. I mean, obviously, we'll talk about other things, but you have to say, well, we want you to raise the value of currency against the dollar. That's very important to us. We'll make concessions to you. Give us your list, and, you know, we'll talk. That's what has to happen. But instead, we have a lot of other things on the list, and it's other interests being served. Okay, so, for example, one of the things on our list, we want them to respect Bill Gates, Microsoft's copyrights. You know, Microsoft is very upset. They say, you know, there's all their, you know, people are making copies of Windows in China, and they're not paying them. So Geithner is going to sit down there and say, hey, you know, you've got to enforce Bill Gates' copyrights. He's very upset. You've got to do that. So he tells him that. Um, Pfizer, you know, uh, our drug companies, we want you to respect our patents. You know, there's all sorts of things like that. Um, Goldman Sachs, they want greater access to the Chinese market. They want to be able to underwrite, underwrite stock and bond issues there. They want more access to the Chinese market. So they say, you know, we want more access for our financial industry. Um, so, so they're putting demands are like that. Also. We have a powerful interest in the U.S. that actually don't want to see a, a, a lower value dollar against the yuan for very concrete reasons. Think about it. Walmart has set up supply chains you know, across China where their competitive advantage is that they get the lowest cost goods. So they've set up these supply chains that allows them to import goods from China at very low cost and could undercut other firms here. They're not the only one who does it by any means, but you know, that's really, they, they've been very upfront on that. They've been very aggressive in doing that and obviously quite successful. They're not anxious to see everything produced in China costing 20% more. They won't go out of business, but, you know, they, they, they spent a lot of effort building up those supply chains. They're really not anxious to suddenly have all their goods cost 20% more. Okay, so you have very mixed interests there. So it's not as though Geithner or whoever's negotiating on behalf of the United States goes there and says, hey, you've got to raise the value of currency. That's really front and center on agenda. He's got a laundry list. And basically the Chinese that's saying, well, we'd kind of like you to do this, but we really don't care. You know, so, so they're not, it's not as though there's sort of a national agenda here. There's very different interests and clearly, at best, the issue of getting the dollar down so we could have more manufacturing jobs is at best a small item on that list. It is not front and center, and I would argue very much it should be. Okay. So just to sort of sum up, what I'd say, you know, where are we likely going here? Um, you know, unfortunately, I think that we're, we're going to take a very long time to recover from this downturn, basically because, you know, the people got us here um, are, are still calling the shots, and they're pretty much doing okay. People should be really, really angry, because, you know, we, we've got still, I mean, the economy's improved some, but we still have close to 25 million people who are either unemployed, they're underemployed, or they're out of the labor force altogether. And the part that's inferior to them about it is they didn't do anything wrong. Okay, these people were working back in 05, 06. They mostly had jobs. Um, they didn't do anything wrong. The people who did things wrong were the folks on Wall Street who were you know, making bad loans, securitizing bad loans. Uh, Alan Greenspan, the people in policy positions in you know, the Treasury Department who were looking in the other way. The other people in my profession were all saying, hey, this is great. Um, they, there, there was actually a conference every year. The, 
uh, Federal Reserve Board holds a conference of central bankers um, they have in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. You can read about it. It's not a secret thing, so I'm not telling you about a secret conspiracy. It's all up on their website. You can read about it, and if anyone's interested, I encourage you to do so. Uh, that, so they had a conference in, in, in the summer of 05. At that point, Greenspan had already announced his retirement in January of 06. So they had a Greenspan retrospective. I, I had a friend who was on the Fed, and he actually I said, well, what's the topic this year? Because every year there's a topic. And he told me it was a Greenspan retrospective, and I started laughing. I looked at him and I realized, oh, you're serious. Uh, so, so it really was. They had a Greenspan retrospective. Uh, I, I remember there was a paper by Alan Blind, who was a very prominent economist, and actually I'd say a good economist, um, where he raised the issue that Alan Greenspan might be the greatest central banker of all time. Um, and, and they, they, they talked about, they, they use this term, the great moderation. You know, that we hear is we've had this, you know, long period since the early 80s where Inflation's been moderate. We haven't had a serious downturn. Everything's just going great. They were all patting themselves on the back. You know, things are just so great. And you just go, my God, how can you guys be so wrong? They're mostly guys. There are a few women there, but mostly guys. Um, you know, and, and so these people deserve an awful lot of blame. So these people messed up, and with very few exceptions, all of them are doing just fine. And again, I raised that in Washington. They think I'm vindictive. I don't know most of these people. And the ones I do, I don't have any grudge against. They just go, you messed up. You messed up really, really bad. But you still have your job. You're still living comfortably. You should be very upset because there are a lot of people that aren't in that boat and they didn't do anything wrong. Okay? And that's really the problem here, that there's been no price to pay for mistakes. And even raising that as an issue in Washington puts you like beyond the pale. You know, like what sort of person would say something like that? So, um, you know, just to conclude, I just say, you know, we, we're going to have a lot of tough times ahead, and I think it's really important, you know, it's great to see people here organizing. You should celebrate the victory that you chased the G8 away. Um, but we've got a lot more to do, and, uh, you know, let's hope we're, we're at least going in the right direction. So, thank you. Someone on the far uh, side here had her hand up first. Oh, sorry, Margaret. My eyesight isn't as good as it used to be. I would recognize it. Rob Emanuel, who's the mayor of Chicago, just announced uh, his billion dollar uh, proposal to have private investment of municipal owned properties and, and services. And I wonder if you could just comment on that kind of proposal for cities. Well, I, I don't know the specifics of his proposal. I'll just say that, you know, very often privatization plans have worked out badly. And, you know, I know you privatized the parking meters here with uh, Morgan Stanley. I said that once. They said, uh, I guess they weren't actually privatized. It's a 75-year lease, is it? So someone really took me to task saying, oh, it wasn't privatization. It was just 75-year lease. Um, not a huge difference, I don't think. But in, in any case, um, you know, very often you end up with, with contracts that, you know, there's a very limited number of bidders. They're often written in such ways that they're very complex, so only a limited number of bidders can be in on them. The public often doesn't have, there's not a lot of transparency. So very often they end up being big giveaways. And, you know, again, I can't say anything about the guidelines that he set up around these proposals, you know, these bond issues. But very, very often they end up being big, big giveaways. And I could just say, you know, I, I am familiar with some studies of privatization at both, you know, the federal and, and state and local level. They usually find that they end up costing more, you know, that you end up wasting money. And in the case of federal government, I know there, there's been a big issue that uh, this, well, I was going to say, I think it actually predates the Bush administration. I think it actually dates the, the Clinton years. But I know Bush was very aggressive about this, that he wanted to contract out a lot of services. And, you know, the, the uh, workers, the union, uh, has said, well, let, let's just see what's more efficient. And when the Government Accountability Office has looked at, you know, the, the private service, the privatized services, the contracted services relative to the public services, almost invariably they find that they end up spending more. And, you know, again, there's kind of obvious reasons there. Uh, you know, the maximum any civil servant is going to get is, you know, what, 150000 160000 You're contracting out with a private company. CEOs usually paying themselves millions. They have, you know, the people under them are getting big six-figure salaries. Um, they have to make profits for their shareholders. So these are kind of obvious reasons why you might think that in many cases uh, the private private services are going to cost more. 
So I'm not going to say you never want private services. Of course, a lot of times it, it is better. You know, you know, I'm not going to want the government to do everything, but I'd be very, very suspicious. And you know, I think you really want a maximum of transparency. Yeah. Yeah, to follow up because I think the promise is that we're suffering under these deficits, that because there's not enough tax revenue coming from people who don't pay taxes, obviously. But the, so the, it's framed that we're broke. And therefore, we need corporations to come and rescue, uh, get us out of this the position. So it's, it's being framed as an innovative partnership between corporate sector and the private and public sector. And I just want to see if you could say whether you think this is an innovation or uh, not. Well, it's not innovation since it's not new. Um, and again, you have to look at the, the specifics to see whether it's getting a good deal or not. I mean, basically, if you think about it, the, the deal with the parking meters was borrowing. You know, it wasn't, I doubt it was sold that way, but that in effect was, you know, uh, I'm not Ron Manuel, uh, Mayor Daley, um, was basically borrowing a large amount of money. So what he did was he signed away a stream of revenue, because if, you know, the city hadn't signed that contract, you'd get the stream of revenue for the next 75 years coming to the city. Instead, he signed that away for money up front from Morgan Stanley and you know the other parties in that consortium. So, oftentimes, uh, that's that's not going to be a real good deal. And if you understand what you're doing, as I say, this is borrowing. If he had sold it as we're going to borrow a huge amount of money from Morgan Stanley, that might not sound very attractive. But that's that's in effect exactly what they did. So, you know, again, I can't say blanketly that every time you partner with the private sector, it's going to be a bad thing to do. Um, but again, when you're starting from a bad position, as you obviously are right now, you start saying we can't raise revenue. I mean, one of the things I should mention, because people have talked to me about this, and I know there's been some effort to push this in, in Chicago, you have the, uh, the mercantile exchange here. Great group to tax, you know, even a very small tax on, uh, on you know, futures and uh, options contracts could raise an awful lot of money, and I know they will yell that they'll all go away, but that's not true. Yes? Well, exporting jobs is about the dollar. People, people. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so, so the question was, uh, the, the two big problems that uh, this gentleman identified were, on the one hand, exporting of jobs, and he said we should have a tax policy to discourage that, and secondly, the military, that you know, we, we've been spending all this money on the military. So let me deal with the first one, deal with those in order. Um, in terms of exporting jobs, I mean, this is the dollar. People export jobs when it's cheaper to produce abroad. And the fact that it's cheaper to produce abroad is determined by the fact that the dollar is overvalued. That is how you're supposed to adjust. The dollar is supposed to fall in value. And it's not done that because we have a lot of, we have other countries that have deliberately tried to keep their currency down. And I'd say we've largely gone along with that. I mean, if I were to give the full story here, I'd date a lot of this to the East Asian financial crisis because the trade deficit really did explode following the East Asian financial crisis and particularly the bailout from it, which was led by Helen Greenspan, Larry Summers, and, and Robert Rubin. Um, so it was really conscious policy that raised the value of the dollar and made a lot of our, our manufacturing uncompetitive. So when I'm talking about the dollar, I am talking about the exporting of jobs. If that wasn't clear, I didn't speak clearly. But, but that's very directly related. And I'd say I think we could probably do much more lowering the value of the dollar than with tax policy. In terms of the military, yeah, it's a drain. I mean, it's, it's, it's a waste. You know, we're, we're taking money that could be spent productively. You know, it could be spent on building up our infrastructure, educating our people, providing health care, any number of things that are productive. Instead, we're spending it on, on useless or even harmful activities. You know, we're talking about wars. So, yeah, I mean, no doubt about it, it's a dream on the economy. At what level would the dollar have to be lowered to compete with the workers in a plant like Foxconn in China or workers in places like Indonesia? Oh, we don't have to lower that level. 
Yeah, we don't we don't have to compete with everyone. The point is, we'll just we'll get some of the business back. We're not going to, you know, those factories aren't going to shut down. We're going to import lots of goods from those countries. They're going to import lots of goods from us. So I'm not expecting that we're going to displace all the factories in China. Um, but you know, there there's big expenses associated with moving to China, and the businesses will tell you this. I mean, if you ever hear, you know, reading the business press, they talk about this all the time. That you know, they have less control over the product. Obviously, it takes time. So if you're talking about a product that you want to bring to market quickly, and you have to ship it from China, it's going to take a month or whatever. These are big issues. You know, certainly, say for apparel, you need the stuff this this month. You know, getting you the the spring wardrobe in June is going to do you a lot of good. So, so there's a lot of reasons why it's costly to do, your, do all your production overseas. But I'm not expecting that it's all going to come back. It won't. It wouldn't make any sense for it all to come back. But as I say, if you lowered the dollar, I, I'd pick a number between 20, 10 and 20 percent. We'd probably get pretty close to balanced trade. And you know, again, none of this is magic. There's not like we have to be exactly here. It has to be exactly balanced. If we have some of a deficit, no big deal. If we end up with some of a surplus, no big deal. That might be a good thing. But you know, there's not a magic number there. But I'd say you know certainly 10 percent, perhaps as high as 20 percent. But again, also that's against an average of currencies. We might not see the dollar fall much at all against the Japanese yen. Maybe not that much against the euro. Presumably, it fall more against the Chinese yuan and some of the East Asian currencies, where I think that it's more overvalued. Yes. Uh, could you speak a little bit about the agreement that Obama made with the Republicans uh, New Year's? where he agreed to cut a whole, a whole lot out of the uh, domestic and consumer uh, spheres. Uh, yeah, yeah, well. Yeah, the, the question is about the agreement that President Obama made with the Republicans. I think you, you mean the one they made last summer, because the deal, he, there are two deals, two big deals he's made. One was in December of 2010, where to extend the, uh, well, extended the tax cuts for two years across the board, and then on top of that, they extended the payroll tax credit for another year and also unemployment insurance benefits. The other deal was last summer, this was around raising the debt ceiling, where he agreed to the series of cuts that were supposed to come to, I think it was $800 billion over the decade in uh, domestic discretionary programs. Um, let me talk about the first one first. Uh, I think he got a horrible deal um, you know, and I think he was really somewhat disingenuous the way he sold it. I mean, the way President Obama, I'm talking about the deal last December of 2010 for, the, for extending the, the payroll tax cut. Um, I, I think, you know, the, if you look, starting with these piece by piece, one of the things extended was unemployment benefits. It's very important to do that. But that was actually very popular among Republicans. You know, and I've seen a number of polls that all show the same thing. You know, most people understand. People aren't employed. They're not, you know, I understand. You've got people who say they're all lazy and they decide not to work. But most people know that's not true. They have friends, family members. If they themselves aren't unemployed, they know it's not just everyone thought they'd go on vacation so they get an unemployment check, you know. So that had support even among Republicans. So if President Obama had just said, I want a freestanding vote on this, I think the Republican Congress would have voted for it because I don't think they could have sat there and gone against that. Um, the payroll tax cut, you know, I, I really hate that that's tied to Social Security. They could have done the exact same thing, said we want to give you a tax credit of 2% of your wages um, and say it has nothing to do with payroll. I mean, nothing to do with Social Security. You know, to, I, I don't know why he threw Social Security in. I mean, he'd say, and I've talked to people, they say, well, the Republicans wouldn't agree to that. Well, why wouldn't they agree to it? Because they want to come back and raise issues about Social Security's funding. So I wish he hadn't done that. You know, we did need that as a boost to the economy, but I wish it were done a different way. Um, I think he could have gotten that through, you know, again, because, you know, that was a very, you know, he ended up saying, you want, you want, the Republicans want to raise your taxes, you know, and, uh, you know, I think they would have backed down. Um, but what he ended up doing was extending the tax cut on high income individuals for, you know, at least another two years. Where that ends up, we'll see after the election and come December. I mean, everything's up for grabs. The other part, um, you know, I didn't like the deal, but the one thing I'll say that was positive, this is the agreement to cut a lot of domestic discretionary, um, the, a lot of cuts in the budget goes beyond domestic discretionary, including, you know, for example, WIC, the Women's Infant and Children uh, Program, uh, provides nutrition uh, for, for young kids and their, their, their mothers. Um, that also subject to cuts. Um, what they have in writing are big cuts, but basically everything is up for grabs after this election. So whether they actually take effect or not, 
really will depend on the outcome of, you know, most immediately the election this fall and then obviously subsequent elections. So most of the big cuts that they actually put in there, if you look at that, they're for 2017, 18, 19. Well, that's going to be determined by the Congress in 2017, 18, 19. It's not determined by, you know, what they signed, you know, in the, in the summer of 2011. So what he agreed to was bad. Its impact might actually not be that much. Is an infrastructure bank something that makes sense? Is it something that has any uh, hope politically? Um, it actually does, and it's one of these things that, you know, the basic point, we should be spending more on infrastructure, and just as a matter of bookkeeping, it doesn't make sense to treat a expenditure on infrastructure, you know, a highway, a railroad that's going to be around for 50 years, to treat it the same as an expenditure for one year. And certainly private businesses don't do that. They depreciate, you know, if a business is building a factory, developing a new line of software, they don't write down that expenditure in a single year. They depreciate over a 10-year, 20-year period, but they ever they expect a useful life to be. That's the way businesses operate. So the logic would be governments should do something like that. Infrastructure bank is one way to get there. Now, for whatever reason, I mean, my view on this is it's not a principled matter. It's just like whatever, whatever, will, whatever will float. So on the one hand, you go, well, this is kind of a new thing. That, you know, that's not the way we ordinarily do things around, you know, around Washington, so it sounds weird. But on the other hand, there have been a number of Republicans who, who have been sympathetic to the idea of an infrastructure bank. So I don't think it's likely, but I do think it's at least possible that, you know, surely it won't happen this year, but maybe in you know, 2013, it's, it's certainly a possibility. For whatever reason, Obama, President Obama has not been vocal in supporting that. I don't know if they've taken a position on it in any way. They certainly haven't been out front saying this would be a really good thing to do. Maybe if he did, it would, it would start to move more. Um, so anyhow, I'd just say I think it is a good idea, um, and it's at least not impossible politically. I mean, if we're going to take a bet on it, I'd say it almost certainly won't happen, but it's, it's not an impossibility. Yes? What are, what are the pros and cons, in your view, uh, regarding thinking about banks as utilities comparable to energy companies? Well, you know, if you go back pre-Glass-Steagall, I think to, to a large extent that is kind of the way they were treated. Commercial banks here I'm thinking of, not the investment banks, and I'll explain the distinction in a second. The, the question, by the way, was what's the advantage or benefit of thinking of banks like utilities uh, similar to electric companies? Um, the deal with Glass-Steagall was that we had banks that had government guaranteed deposits. So, you know, this is, this is why I always love the people who claim they're for deregulation and go, oh, did you want to get rid of government guaranteed? No, no, we wanted the government guaranteed deposits. So they weren't for deregulation. They wanted deregulation, but they didn't want to pay for it. Um, they, I mean, sorry, they wanted insurance, but they didn't want to pay for it. That's not deregulation, that's ripping off taxpayers. Um, but in any case, the, the, the deal with, with uh, Glass-Steagall is that you have banks that have government guaranteed deposits. The quid pro quo is that they're going to be safe. They're going to engage in a very narrow range of activities. They can make mortgage loans, they can make small business loans, they can make credit card loans, consumer loans, very narrow category of activity. You can't go making complex derivatives, you can't, you know, you can't go off trading on your own, so you, you have this strict separation. I think that made sense. That made a lot of sense, and we lost a lot when we got rid of Glass-Steagall because basically that took away all the bounds. They, they'd been weakening Glass-Steagall. I should point out it wasn't a sharp break that suddenly we repealed Glass-Steagall in '99 and took off all the constraints because they'd been removing a lot of constraints. So we didn't have a peer system even pre-repeal. But you know, in '99 you had the formal repeal, and basically they could do whatever they want. I think it makes a lot of sense to go back to something like that. And, you know, ostensibly you have the Volcker rule. This was part of the uh, Dodd-Frank financial reform bill that passed in 2010 that is supposed to recreate something like that, saying that banks can't trade on their own account. I'm not very confident. I mean, th this is really kind of textbook Washington. Um, you know, I, I don't like to think of myself as naive, but it did was somewhat of a surprise to me. Um, you realize that with something like the Volcker Rule, everything is how it's written. And you get to the details of the rulemaking process. You know, Goldman Sachs has had four people full-time on it. Morgan Stanley has four people full-time on it. Citigroup, well, what do we have on our side? You know, there's a few people like me in their spare time. It's not my area of expertise. I'm not a lawyer. You know, I could read this stuff up and probably learn about it, but I don't have time to do that. I don't have to pay me to do that. I can't, you know. So totally outgunned. So even though I think the progressive side really did a surprisingly good job 
and trying to influence the legislation, which is far from perfect, but you know, the progressive voice was heard, the labor unions, the consumer groups, they were heard and had an impact. But once you get to the rulemaking, they own it. And because the Volcker rule, you know, the principle behind it's a good one, but it really gets down to the details, they own the details, and we're going to lose on that. So I think restoring Glass-Steagall would be a great idea because, again, the point here is, you know, on the one hand, you get financial firms that, you know, do whatever they want, they blow up, it's their problem, you know, which also gets to the too big to fail issue. But let's say we have, you know, smaller firms that, you know, they blow themselves up, that's their problem, their stockholders, their problem. But when they have government guaranteed deposits, then that's our problem. And they shouldn't be allowed to do that. So, yeah, I, I think it'd be great to return to the Glass-Steagall world. Not likely to happen anytime soon. Yes, and back. Uh, as I understand it, you're advocating producing an economic stimulus by reducing the value of the dollar relative to the currencies of other countries. Won't, won't that lead to inflation? Yeah, so the question was, uh, I'm advocating uh, stimulus by reducing the value of the dollar relative to other currencies, and then the question is, doesn't that lead to inflation? It does lead to some inflation. So, so the basic story is that we're, we're borrowing now from other countries to get to buy more than what we sell. So we have this big trade deficit. Yeah. Well, we could do that for a long time. We could do a small amount of borrowing literally forever, but you know, we're borrowing 6% GDP. It's the exact same story when people talk about the budget deficit. So in effect, we're borrowing to get cheap goods. Um, I don't think it's a good thing to do in either the short term or the, or the long term. It's not a good thing to do in the short term because these are jobs we're losing. We don't have, we're losing a lot of good jobs that we can't easily replace. So it's not a good thing to do in the short term. It's not a good thing to do in the long term because at some point, you know, we're gonna, you know, China and these other countries aren't gonna be lending to us forever and in effect, well, we can think of from the other side, from the standpoint of China or uh, Vietnam or the other countries that are, are in fact lending us money um, to, to keep down the value of their currency, make their goods cheap, they're basically pa paying us to buy their stuff. And I don't think people in China are going to pay us to buy their stuff forever because they could pay their own people to buy their stuff. So, yeah, I mean, the, the outcome of the story I'm talking about is their goods will cost more. So if you want some simple arithmetic on it, I've been throwing around 10%. Currently, we import about 16% of GDP. Let's imagine that the price of everything we import rose by 10%. That would lead to a increase in you know, prices of 1.6 percentage points for a spread over two or three years. To me, it's not a real big deal. I mean, other people might be more concerned. But you know, again, the alternative is continuing borrowing. I don't, that doesn't seem like a really good route to me. But yeah, it would lead to somewhat higher inflation, no doubt about it. Yes? Um. What is, what is our exposure to what is happening with the euro and with Greece? And where is that going to most affect us? That's a good question. So, so the question is, what's our exposure to, to the euro and the, the situation in Greece, how it will affect us? I, I sort of put there, there are two different stories you could tell here. One is sort of the, the meltdown, the Lehman story, where you get a, a collapse, uh, what's sometimes referred to as a disorderly default. So you have Greece, or you know, the bigger issue would be one of the bigger countries, whether it's Spain or Italy. They suddenly go, we can't pay our debts. We have, uh, we have a bond issue that we have to make you know, a 20 billion payment on, and we don't have it. You know, we don't have the money, and no one's going to give it to us, so we have to default. And then suddenly you get this wave of collapses, just as we have with Lehman, that you know, suddenly all these banks in, in the euro that you know, had a ton of Europe, uh, Italian debt, they don't have, you know, they have to write that down, so they're now insolvent. Everyone thinks Spain's going to go belly up, so they have to write down that debt. And suddenly no one trusts anyone anymore, and basically the financial system starts to shut down. If that happened, there's no way we could escape that. Um, so we would see, you know, again, it might not be as bad as what we had in the fall of 08, but we would take a really big hit. It almost certainly mean a double dip, um, you know, probably unemployment rate shooting up a bit, and you know, very very bad story. Um, I think we're beyond that now. The European Central Bank came up with a very clever move. I, I give them credit for it. It's not what I would have liked to have seen, but it was very effective in preventing that. Basically, what the European Central Bank said was, we're going to let the banks. They're not letting the countries, but they'll let the banks across the eurozone borrow as much as they like for three years at very low interest, 1% interest. They're using that money then to bail out their governments. So, you know, the Italian banks borrow the money from the European Central Bank and then they lend it to the Italian bank, uh, Italian government. Guess what? You know, you're borrowing at 1%, you're lending at 5 or 6 it's pretty profitable. Um, 
So the banks do really, really well on that story. Um, it keeps the countries, the, the, the sovereign, it prevents the sort of debt default that I was talking about. So it keeps things going. Um, the real bad part from my view, well, one is it's free money to the banks, but the other part, the more serious part is basically they can keep squeezing these countries. And if you look at you know, their, their projections for Greece, it's just horrible. They're looking at double digit unemployment for a decade. You know, and, and they consistently, these are their projections. This is my view of it. This is their projections. Their projections have consistently been overly optimistic. So it looks like a horrible story for the people of Greece, the people of Spain, the people of Portugal. So it's a really bad story for those people. But I think they prevented the Lehman sort of collapse. Now, the other part of that story, the second scenario is, well, are they going to have a recession? Well, Europe probably is in a Eurozone. Well, England too, so I could probably say Europe more generally. They're, they're probably in a recession. Um, at very best, they're going to see extremely weak growth. That does have an impact on our economy. Uh, it means we're exporting less to them. Um, that, that will have some impact on slowing growth here. But it's really not that big an impact because it's important to understand we're not talking about them falling off a cliff when they're in a recession. We're talking about their economy shrinking by, let's say, half percent or in a bad scenario, one percent. I mean, some countries will do worse than that, but you know, taking Europe as a whole, half percent or one percent. The alternative isn't them growing five percent. The alternative is them growing one, one half percent. 2%. Um, that difference, you know, when it comes to our exports, our exports to the Eurozone are about 2% of our GDP. Let's say we'd have 25% more exports, that, that, that's about half 1% of GDP. That's not trivial, but that's not huge here. So this is certainly dampening growth in the United States. It's a negative. It's not a huge negative. It's not something, if otherwise the economy is doing okay, it's going to kill us. So it's not something you want to see. I'm just talking about from the standpoint of the U.S., but it's not going to kill us. Other questions? Yes, in back. President, uh, there's a lot of speculation that um, President Obama is con seriously considering Larry Summers to be president of the World Bank. And your think tank has um, come out and endorsed Jeffrey Sachs as a strong alternative um, for, for, for president of the World Bank. And I'm wondering a couple questions. One, um, you know, why, you know, the, the, Jeffrey Sachs' name has, you know, obviously has a lot of baggage attached to it in terms of his history as a shock doctor um, in Bolivia and Eastern Europe. And yet, you know, it's worth noting, as some of your um, op-eds, your, your colleague Mark Weisbrot has been writing about this, and a lot of Latin American governments are strongly campaigning for, for Sachs to be president of the World Bank. So, so if you could just talk a little bit about why your organization supports Sachs for World Bank, what would be the difference? What difference would it make if it was Sachs versus Summers or someone else? And then thirdly, why does the World Bank matter? I mean, why does it matter who the president of the World Bank is? And what, what, of, what, of what global significance is this? Okay, so, so the question is that, you know, we're looking at candidates for the World Bank, and Larry Summers is widely uh, viewed to be the leading candidate. You know, of course, you'd, well, come on, about Larry Summers in a second. Um, uh, I, I should say it wasn't my organization. Mark Weisbrot is my co-director. Has I, I don't know if I, I mean I'm hap would be happy to see Sachs get it. I don't know if I've publicly written that anywhere. I'm, I'm not trying to hide anything. I just don't think I publicly said that. But I'd be happy to see him get him get it. And uh, so what difference would it make if Sachs got it? And then the third question is what difference does it make? Who's you know who who runs the World Bank? Um, Summers. Well, I could go on at length about Summers, but I mean, I think Summers, you know, is very much an orthodox economist. I wrote a piece about him that you may have seen. I joked about him being like Dick Nixon, how we had the new Dick Nixon with the new Larry Summers. And, you know, Larry Summers was in the Clinton administration. He was there at the center when they deregulated. They passed um, the, the repeal of Glass-Steagall. He also, there, there was a famous meeting that some of you might have heard about uh, with Brooks Lee Bourne, who at that time was head of the uh, Commodity Futures Trading Commission. I believe it was 98, 98, 99. And she was saying, she was raising the issue that we have all these derivatives that are no one's watching. You know, credit default swaps being the most important, and certainly subsequently became the most important. But in any case, all these derivatives, no one's watching. They're not, they're traded over the counter. So she's looking at the exchanges. So the stuff going on over here at the exchange here, that she's watching. But the stuff that's going on over the counter that AIG was doing, no one is watching. So she says it's a really big issue. And Larry Summers, along with Alan Greenspan and Robert Rubin, they said, you stupid girl, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm saying that deliberately because I've talked to people who are at the conversation, and they said it was very sexist. All the people who were arguing with it were men. Um, so, that's, so it's not accidental that I'm saying that. Um, 
and they overrode her. And of course, you know, they there were no regulations put in, and that was sealed with the what was the Commodity Futures Modernization Act in 2000 um, that they could not regulate all these derivatives. So, you know, Larry Summers was really very much at the center of that. He was very much at the center of the high dollar policy. He thought that was really cool. Um, he also supported, uh, you know, he thought the stock bubble was just fine. He thought the housing bubble, I talked about the Alan Greenspan retrospective, you know, they, where they were doing the tribute to, to um, Alan Greenspan in 05. There was an economist, actually, uh, um, I'm forgetting his first name, his last name is Rajan, he's actually University, University of Chicago, very mainstream economist. But he was raising this issue that there's a lot of reason for concern. And Summers got up and just derided him, saying, oh, you're, you're, you're a Luddite. You, don't, you, don't, you just don't understand modern finance. Um, so, so that was the old Larry Summers, and supposedly there's a new Larry Summers, and you know, I, I, I wouldn't count on it. So I, I'm not anxious to see him there. Now, Sachs, you know, as you rightly say, there, there's, there's a mixed record, and some of this is disputed by Sachs himself. I, I, won't, I don't know the details. I'll just say you know, the, some of the issues, and you can decide where this falls. Um, he's been advising developing countries for the last quarter century. Um, Bolivia was one that he advised in the, the 80s. He said he takes credit for stopping their inflation. They really did have hyperinflation. I mean, people here yell about 4%, 5%, 8% inflation. They have inflation on the order of tens of thousands of percent. Your economy can't operate with that. That really is a big problem. He, he, their hyperinflation did stop. He certainly deserves credit for it. The question is how much blame does he serve? They, they, they had a very severe recession after that. Um, he said he only advised them for a year and that those were not his policies. I'm not position to judge that. Um, he did arrange, and this I will give him credit for, he did arrange a very large write down of Bolivia's debt. So he forced that through, he got, uh, he, he pushed that through, uh, got the Bush administration to go along, Bush won administration. Um, with, with East Europe, he said he opposed the privatizations. You know, again, I'm not in a position to judge that. Um, but he said that he had, you know, what he often, his line is that, you know, the idea was shock and therapy. He expected much more therapy, and when the therapy wasn't forthcoming, he said he opposed the shock. I, I can't judge that. I don't know. That's his side. Other people have said different things. You know, I don't know. I haven't looked at it closely enough. What I will say is that in the last decade, he's been very aggressive speaking up for developing nations in a lot of important contexts. He's been very big yelling about the AIDS fund, that they should buy generic drugs rather than buying Pfizer's drugs and paying more for them, that they should get generics. Um, he's encouraged uh, sub-Saharan African nations to just default on their debt. You know, use the money to pay for health care, pay for education, great thing. Um, he's pressed uh, to get Haiti's debt relieved. Um, so he's taken a number of good stands, and I'd say courageous stands. He's gotten, you know, both the Bush administration and Obama administration very angry at him for taking those positions. So I think it would really be a big thing to have him at the World Bank. Um, now, realistically, precisely because he's taken those positions, I don't think it's likely, but I think it's fantastic that you know we're actually having this debate. That you know people are saying, "Hey, it's not just going to be a hack," and and I'm saying that quite literally because you look at the last two people, Zolik, What was his background in development? I don't recall one. Uh, Wolfowitz. What was it? You know. So so we've had people there. It's traditionally been a, a place where you put a political hack, and you know what what you have now is a serious discussion, and you have developing countries saying that it should not, you've had many countries, uh, Mexico actually spoke up on this, the finance minister of Mexico, saying this should not be a political appointment, it should be someone with expertise in development. Um, it's kind of, you know, very big change, because they've always, the, the pattern has always been, hey, the president of the U.S. gets to pick it, and end of story. Um, what, what difference does it make for the developing world? Uh, hard to say. I mean, I think the World Bank has had a largely negative impact in the developing world uh, since, it, you know, since it's come into existence. Not 100%, but a lot of it's been very negative. They were very aggressively pushing privatization in the 90s and I'm sure up to the present in contexts where it clearly didn't make sense. Um, they, they were very aggressive pushing privatization of Social Security. This is uh, you know, something I actually had some direct contact with because I knew uh, one of the people who was in on this. Um, if you look across the developing world, particularly Latin America, almost all those countries privatize their social security system. And uh, someone who I got to know uh, was writing a review of it for the World Bank. He's a World Bank economist. He'd been there a number of years. And it was really kind of fascinating because this guy was actually a conservative uh, economist. He'd studied with Milton Friedman at the University of Chicago. So he was conservative in the sense that he believed in a free market. But his, his, his view of this was, well, I understand why you'd have a mandatory Social security system. We want to make sure everyone puts aside, you know, some money for their retirement. 
And he goes, and I understand why you'd want a, a well-working, you know, voluntary pension system. But why do we force people to put their money into private pensions? And, you know, he's just using Milton Friedman logic. If, if these are good, why do we have to force people? And he rev was reviewing the, the privatized systems, and he had a very critical review. He said that they were extremely expensive, people didn't trust them, and they were voting with their feet against them. And it was kind of a great story, because Chile is always the one that's held up as a model, and it probably is better than most of them. And it was also the first to, to privatize back in 81 under Pinochet. And he was looking at Chile. On the one hand, you have the formal sector, where people don't have a choice, they're in it. But most of the Chilean workers, it was certainly true then, I think it's still true today, are in the informal sector. They don't have to be in it. So they vote with their feet. Do they want to be in it? Well, what were they doing? There was a minimum benefit. If you contributed for 10 years, you got the minimum benefit. The vast majority of people in the informal sector who participated as all, participated for 10 years, they got the minimum benefit and then got out. So people were voting with their feet for a traditional defined benefit social security type system in this privatized system. They're voting against the privatized system. So he wrote a very critical review and he had to fight like crazy to get that through the World Bank. They did everything they could. They wanted to change it. They were yelling at him. You know, he had to go through I don't know how many review processes. And it was only because the uh, chief economist at that time was very sympathetic to it that it got through because a lot of higher ups uh, would have killed it. Um, so anyhow, that, that's all a, a digression. But They've promoted privatization in contexts where, again, I'd say it's been appropriate. I'm not saying that all privatizations are bad. There are times where it made sense. You had poorly run government enterprises. Yeah, you might want to privatize them. But they're pro proposing privatization of water systems where you were just coming, having Bechtel and other companies come in, rip off people, um, privatization of social security systems that the financial sector made out like banned. Um, his assessment was that in a lot of these, uh, a lot of the uh, privatized social security systems, 20 to 30 percent of the money that went into the system was siphoned off by the financial industry. Um, if you compare it to our social security system as a well-run system, not that theirs would all be that well-run, but as an example of a well-run system, it was half of 1 percent. So you had 20 to 30 percent of your money being thrown in the garbage paying intermediaries as opposed to half of 1 percent in a public system. Um, that seems kind of a no-brainer. Why wouldn't you want the public system? Um, so anyhow, I'd say the World Bank has, for the most part, played a negative role, not everywhere and always, but, you know, it's an average a negative role. And if you could have, you know, someone like Sachs there, I think it, it, it could have a very big impact. It wouldn't turn everything around overnight, but I think it could have a very big impact. Is there specific policy that we can boil down? The middle of the United States, we, of course, are seeing, you know, the, the continuing, you know, global sort of dissolution in the policies of the G8 and G20 moving forward. Is there something we can boil down that we can be talking about? Uh, a to our friends and neighbors, B to candidates, when we're asking them about specific policy uh, in terms of what we could be advocating for to help do some of the things that uh, you believe would help this recovery move forward in a more egalitarian way. <coughs> Well, sure. I mean, there's a long, there, there's a long list of uh, unlikely distant targets, but the short list. I, I think stimulus is something that can be sold. I mean, I think getting money to state and local governments, getting money to uh, fund infrastructure, um, you know, and I'm saying this based on sort of, I like it. I'm saying looking at polling data. Um, I, I think people really do understand that. I, you know, I understand most people are not economists, not thinking about the economy on a day-to-day -day basis. But, but the logic, you know, that people work building roads, I mean, that's not a hard thing to understand, you know, so, so that if we, had, if we had more money out there, you know, supporting infrastructure and that we benefit from it, I think people do understand that. And it has the benefit, you know, it's, I call this the slop theory of, uh, of politics, you know, guess, guess who likes, you know, the spending? Well, contractors, you know, and, uh, you know, one of the good things, actually, I should give Obama some credit for, some of this, of course, can be green and should be green. Um, you know, a friend of mine is in Ohio, she's with a policy group there. They had a lot of these green projects, some coming from the federal government, but some actually done by the state government when they had a Democratic governor there. And the Republican governor there, uh, Kasich, won't touch them. And that's because they have all these contractors who are Republicans who are getting contracts to retro <coughs> retrofit buildings. Um, so I think the idea of stimulus, you know, saying we need stimulus, we, we have to do more in the economy, and, you know, there, there are things that we know that can be done, and many of them quickly. Um, I should have made more of a point by talking about green stuff, because that can be done quickly. I mean, retrofitting buildings, you know, when you look at some of the data, some, one of my friends 
Robert Poland, University of Massachusetts, has done some research on this. These things pay back, you know, very often, I guess everywhere, but very often they pay back in five, six, seven years. So it's not like these are risky propositions. So they both pay as an economic proposition, but obviously from an environmental standpoint, if you could talk about reducing the energy consumption of a home by 20, 30, 40 percent, which in many cases you realistically can, that's a really big deal. So I think getting, getting stimulus back on the agenda, and again, you know, talking to people in Washington say, ah, you can never do that, but um, I, I somehow think that's not quite right. They've been wrong a lot on the politics. We'll take maybe one more question after this, because I think we're getting close to time. How critical is it that we advocate for wage like recovery so that we don't wind up in another debt hole? Well, uh, this is a question if people didn't hear how important is we get wage led recovery rather than uh, another debt level, debt led bubble. I, I'd say it's, it's extremely important. I mean, I, I wrote one of my books uh, a couple of years, a few years back now, uh, Plunder and Blunder The Rise and Fall of the Bubble Economy. And my story there, and I still think it's very much right, is that you know we had an economy in the three decades following World War II where you had sort of this virtuous circle that productivity growth pretty directly translated into wage growth. Workers then spent more, increased demand, led to more investment, more productivity growth, et cetera, et cetera. So that did, you didn't get any big bubbles of 50s, 60s into the 70s. So there are problems there, but no big bubbles. Um, that ends in the 80s, um, a lot of it by design. So you have a real weakening of the unions. I was conscious policy of the Reagan administration. We had a high dollar in the, that period, a lot of other things, deregulation of major sectors weakening of the unions, it breaks the link between wages and productivity growth. So what that meant was that you had more room for speculation, more room for these speculative bubbles to develop. And again, in the 90s, we got the, the stock bubble, and in the last decade, the housing bubble. How do you get back there? Um, well, there's a lot of different things, but I think high, high employment, low unemployment is the biggest part of that story. And that's why, you know, I always look to the late 90s and you go, it's very, very much a mixed bag. On the one hand, 4% unemployment, that was great. People had jobs who never otherwise would have. And you saw wage growth up and down the income ladder. Um, problem was, what well, was sustaining that at that point was the stock bubble, which, of course, was unsustainable. Um, so if we could get back to a situation where you did see broadly based wage growth, that's, that's really what a healthy economy is about. Uh, I don't see a way of getting there, by the way, unless we go the route of the lower value dollar. I mean, I really do think that's front and center. And I know that's not something people talk about often, but I, but I think we have, to, we have to find ways to say that. In Washington, they say that, they go, you can't advocate a lower dollar. That sounds like you're weak. You know, you know so we've got to find better terms. I mean, uh, Ernest Collins used to be a senator from South Carolina. He used to say, what you want to say is a competitive dollar. So I don't know if that's the right term, but you know, we need, probably need a better term than a lower value dollar. One more question. Um, what, what do you think why Obama went with Summers you know, after winning a campaign on the premise of hope and change as opposed to someone like Stiglitz or Krugman uh, or yourself? I mean, what, what, what do you think was what's the decision based on? Okay, the question is what, what, why do I think Obama went with Summers as opposed to you know, a more progressive economist, uh, Krugman or Stiglitz being obvious candidates? Um, you know, it's kind of funny, uh, after I was supporting Obama in the primaries over, over Clinton, and I had some back and forth with, with Krugman, who I know, I mean, we're not good friends, but we do have exchanges. And, uh, it, was, it was over a very short period of time, uh, he announced that he was picking uh, Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State, and Summers and Geithner, you know, basically the old team, as his, his uh, economic advisors. So uh, Krugman wrote in his blog, he goes, well, I know many people supported uh, Obama because he'd taken the right stand on the Iraq war and they didn't want to see the Clinton economic team back. How do you feel now? <laughs> um, anyhow, so that was a good point, point Krugman. Um, I'll tell you what I think happened there, and it's not a pretty story. I, I think it's just, you know, he, politicians in general are going to take the safest route. And, you know, we could compare Obama to other politicians, might say he's better, might say he's worse in some ways, but at the end of the day, he's a politician. And what's the safest route? You got Robert Rubin there, you know, still big mucky muck in the Democratic Party, no doubt about it. He knows everyone with money. Um, he was close, to, you know, he, he was, during the primaries, during the election, he was in those meetings. He was very close. Um, he's going, I got these guys for you. Summers had been Treasury Secretary. Geithner had been, you know, in the Treasury, all these different positions. You know, these, these people have the experience, they know what they're doing. That was the easy thing to do. Bring in Stiglitz, boy, 
hell's going to break loose. Bring in Krugman, hell's going to break loose. So it would have been a real tough move. If, if Barack Obama had been a committed progressive, he was going to go, you guys sank the economy. I'm not going to put you back in positions of responsibility. He would have gone with the Krugman. He would have gone with the Stiglitz. He would have gone with someone on the left. But that wasn't him. Barack Obama was a politician, and you know the path of least resistance was go with the old school, and that's what he did.